immigrants and indigenous, and I'll be, of course, explaining that. Um, I never use these, so I have no idea. Oh, to that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. The, the bottom button? No, no, on the side, but the one that's supposed to do. There you go. Oh, excellent. Okay. So good. So just to give you a little bit of background in political science, I'm in comparative politics, so we look at governments and politics of individual countries outside of the United States, so less the international system and more really digging into individual countries and then comparing them across um, a lot of different areas. Um, my main area of work in my career so far has been Mexican politics. So I work on areas like social movements, indigenous politics, ethnic and racial politics, and on immigration. Um, Recently, I've been um, working with Mexican co-authors on criminal violence. A lot of my topics you can see are um, kind of um, track what's been going on in Mexico. So migration, if you're a Mexicanist, you had to understand migration. So I did some work on that and then developed this class that I'll be bringing here at, to the Catholic University. And now criminal violence. Unfortunately, criminal violence is such in Mexico that many of us have been turned to work on security-related issues. Um, because they seem so relevant and important for the country. Um, so I'm in a teaching college, Allegheny College. It's a liberal arts college. Um, not a model that we've had any success, or maybe we haven't tried too hard to export to the rest of the world. So there are, there are liberal arts and science programs, but the liberal arts college model is very much um, a kind of US, um, maybe eccentricity. Um, and so. Um, I'm bringing um, that model to my students at Catholic University. Um, we'll see how maybe that will be settled to them, or maybe it'll be more of a, of a measurable difference, but we'll have to see as we go on. Um, so really, as I've been here, the, I've actually came early the last six weeks, I noticed, of course, that I'm really seeing so much of the world around me as a Mexicanist and doing that kind of comparative work on a just informal and kind of anecdotal basis. So of course I'm seeing it as U.S., but largely really as a Mexicanist. You know, how are things happening here? How does Santiago compare to Mexico City, um, for example? Um, all right, so um, like many of you, are, I, I have a half teaching, half research um, Fulbright, and um, just parenthetically, I really appreciate those of you who didn't have to be here, the students at different levels coming in listening to this. It's really nice to interact with you all. Um, so I decided um, in the fall to teach a course in the regular curriculum at um, the, the Universidad Católica in the Institute of Political Science. And the reason for that is I actually talked to a Fulbrighter last year who was in my institute, and he said, you know, I, because I didn't teach a regular class, I had um, just two graduate students, and that was fun, and it was great, but it might have been neat to, have to you know, work with the undergraduates a little bit more. So I thought, well, this is a challenge for me, too. Let me see if I can, there's a class already on the books that I could fit into. It might not be the exact title I wanted, but I was interested in it. So it turned out to be this one. ICP 0337, Migraciones Internacionales in America Latina. So, um, so I never teach 50 students at once, just for the record. We're a liberal arts college, you know, maximum students I've ever had in the class is like 32. So that's a challenge that's really interesting and exciting for me to see if I can bring some of these methods that I normally use in such a, a different classroom and with different expectations that the students might have. I have two teaching assistants. We don't have teaching assistants at Allegheny. If we do, there are undergraduates who are really ambitious, who just want to help us. But it's really more for them. They're not grading. We would never have our students grade. So this is going to be really, it's already been interesting. I've met with these TAs um, over the course of February here and there. And so that'll, that's already been a really interesting experience for me, working with them. Um, they happen to be two migrants. Um, two young women that have lived in Chile now for eight to ten years, but one is from Bolivia, one is from Peru, so that's already bringing another perspective for me into the classroom. Um, I knew that the, the issue of migration would be a timely one here, but I really had no idea it would be as timely as it's turned out to be, even in the last month. In the last month, over the course of a couple days, there, the headlines of the major newspapers were, Migración se ha doblado en Chile. 
the last two years, or migraciones eh, llegando a un record, right? And so, so now, like even in the public space, the idea that, wow, we're at record levels of foreign-born population here in Chile, and while that record for in U.S. standards um, is 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 not nearly as large. Chile has about today now 6.6 percent foreign-born population. But thinking about five years ago, and it was only around three percent. That is major. That's the equivalent of going in the United States from 13 percent, which we are currently at, to 26 in five years. And you can imagine the possible political and you know, real political ramifications of that already. Right, so people are seeing it on the ground, and so that is the reason that I have 50 students in my class. It's certainly not because of me, since nobody has the slightest idea who I am, nor do they recognize my name. So it's because of that, and so that's really exciting. People want the students really want to learn. At least they seemed enthusiastic on the first day, which was Wednesday. Um, so you can imagine the challenges coming from so many different areas: schools. Some of you work in education, health. Right. Um, even when I teach, when people ask me what I'm doing here, and I tell them, even in like the grocery store lines, which if you've been in a leader, you will be there at least a half hour, so you can have some conversations. I say I'm teaching class immigration, and everyone has an opinion, you know. And this one woman told me, well, I'm a nurse, and I can tell you right now, migrants don't get their vaccinations. So interesting, right? You know, I, people have opinions about things that they're coming from their perspective. It's so interesting for me to hear those. Um, so what's, uh, in recent legal changes, there's a new law um, that is right now going through the Chilean Congress. It's passed the House of Representatives. It's waiting now in the Senate. This will really make a difference in terms of how the Chilean state is dealing with its migrants. And so luckily I have a, a very good friend who has um, very good contacts in the foreign relations ministry, so I've met a couple times already with them and so now I have every document you could possibly need or want I'm not sure I could pass them on all of the information that they're publishing now in the paper I have the statistical like demographic information they've been very generous with me in passing that on um, what surprised me this far well that my colleagues at the Catholic University assign most all of their readings in English so they told me don't worry about that you know it's great that you're giving the class in Spanish but you know, 90%, my basic 90% of our readings are in English. And since I use their syllabus as a kind of model for mine in terms of the rules, I could see that that's indeed the case, that about 90%. Mine is less. I tried to make it more like 60, 60 or 65. But, um, but that's a lot, and so that's expected. So that is a little easier for me, but it's a challenge for them. But it's something that they claim in the department that they want their students to do. But yeah, that's no matter what, yeah, it's a big deal. Um, being at a research university, I already told you, you know, different than a liberal arts college. I don't know how exactly, but we'll find out soon. Um, I should say that the department um, at the Catholic University in Political Science is number one ranked in Latin America, so it's a very, very well respected um, university and department, and it's like. 34th in the world in terms of political science. So it's a much better department in terms of ranking than Al Little Allegheny College, right? So for me, it's like also, wow, I'm feeling like I really want to be on my A game with these folks and also the students because it's a very, very good department. Okay, so guest speakers. So this is really exciting. So I don't know if they do this, but this I wanted to do no matter what. And my colleagues claim to say that this is a nice thing, so I, I guess it's all right. But since I had, um, you know, five, five weeks in Santiago, and 40% of the people were gone, but not all of them. And the, so I was able to talk, and I got a lot of WhatsApp contacts with people who were gone but were able to get right back to me, which is really wonderful. Um, this is my contact from my graduate school friend who's at the um, Organization of American States, so she put me right in touch with this man. This man is uh, a really, Im I, by impressive, I don't mean to sound paternalistic, like I am impressed with the way he deals with his staff, like he brings people in when I'm having meetings with him, I've had to, and really is collaboratory with the, with the people in his office. I've, he, he's, I've learned a lot from him already. So he is bringing a team into my class. He's already said he'll come. This is exciting. It's very organized. Carolina Toa, again, another contact through our board of directors at Allegheny College. Um, she, former mayor of 
Santiago, the concierge in my in my apartment gave me a magazine the other day from Mercurio, the 13 women in, who are redefining power in Chile, and she was one of them. Well, since I only know like three women in Chile like so far, <laughs> knowing one of them is Carolina Tojo, I felt like, oh wow, I'm so, my, my friends are setting me up well. So anyway, she's wonderful, very modest um, woman. She's coming to my class, we've already confirmed the day. Um, this guy is Chilean, I'm sorry, it's Chubi Rekova. He um, is what I understand to be like the number one person in the U.S. working on Chilean immigration. He's Chilean himself, but has made his career in the U.S. He's doing a teleconference. Um, Jose Tomas Vicuña is, there's an organization called Servicio Jesuita Migrantes. Um, he right away agreed to come to my class to talk about incorporation of migrants. So the question of, you know, hey, people are here, what about settlement? What about um, just, you know, social um, solidarity and getting people set up and some education and, and the like. So he's coming. And then a very distinguished guest already <laughs> confirmed to talk about Fulbright opportunities. <laughs> yes, you all know him. I had to look through many of my channels to get this Okay, so on the, on, the, on the other side here, so immigrants cross borders, that's pretty evident. Um, indigenous peoples in, 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 in many ways are crossing borders too, right? Because one, across Latin America, they've made claims um, and demands for autonomy, right? Around territory, around resources. And so oftentimes that involves a kind of um, borders or self-defined borders or um, demands for some kind of, of, of separateness depending on the country. Um, all of you probably know there's been a real fraught relationship with the Mapuche people and the Chilean state um, for as long as Chile has been a nation state. Um, so I'll tell you about my project in just a second, but both immigrants and indigenous peoples really pose a very important question about citizenship and about national identity in the country. And so I think that's kind of the philosophical basis, even though my project isn't philosophical, it's institutional, much more public policy based. There is that question of who are we? And if that's not grappled with in a kind of public fashion or um, in an open fashion, it's going to be really d difficult for the country to come to terms with the current influx of migrants. At least that's what I'm um, arriving at so far. This recent migration, um, and the numbers are bearing this out, for the first time in you know 15 years, Peruvian immigrants have been displaced by Venezuelans is the number one number, and then Haitians, um, which in terms of racial and class, not so much class, um, but race and class are very visible, and that makes that, that makes it different than our other kinds of even South American migrants, and of course from Europe. So there are some new challenges. Um, so plans in Chile research on Indian autonomy. So my colleague um, at the at the Universidad Católica. Carla Alberti, who couldn't be here today because they're doing a seminar in the early afternoon, and so she's the moderator, so it just didn't make a lot of sense. Um, I do work in Mexico with Mexican co-authors on how indigenous communities manage illicit behavior, illicit products. Um, unfortunately, in Mexico, that's drugs. But here, it tends to be on the Bolivian-Chilean border contraband, right? A lot of smuggling. And so our real interest is why do some and how do some communities cooperate peaceably with those criminal organizations or coexist or use forms of self-restraint, but manage to kind of keep themselves intact and others don't. Others are either overcome by those criminal organizations like the case of Mexico or can't resist their influence and then become kind of corrupt themselves. And so we'd like to do a comparative analysis of those kind of borderland indigenous peoples here. That might be harder to do. We might only be able to design this while I'm here. And then this is something, the question of different models of autonomy, indigenous autonomy across Latin America, this might be more doable here right now. This, this I think, was very ambitious. I'm not sure, given the fact that February is now gone, <laughs> as was everyone else. I'm not sure if this <laughs> is, is possible, but it could be for, um, I'm not on sabbatical, so it could be for my sabbatical in a year. Um, so that would be really great. And then finally, um,
this a very good um, academic journal um, is actually located at the Catholic University. And so Cristian Perez had asked me to do their annual review of Mexican politics for their review this year. And that's great because I know something about uh, Mexican <laughs> politics and know nothing about Chilean politics. So I'm doing that while I'm here. I practically had to, right? Somebody from the department asked me to write an article. I'm in the department. I, so it, it's a little fun to do. Um, yeah, and so of course I'm going to bring these insights to my own immigration class I teach in the fall. We have a lot of money from an Endeavor Foundation grant to do short courses, so maybe I'll have luck at bringing in one of these actors that I'm talking about right now to come to campus as a practitioner to talk about some of the challenges that a country like Chile. We, we do a lot in the U.S. on Mexican migration. That's important, but now it's a historic case since we have net zero migration from Mexico to the U.S. So it might be interesting for the students to bring in South America case. Um, and I work a lot on politics and memory. Of course, that's just all around us all the time. We haven't had any chance to talk about that. But if the student, anyone who's here, um, has any interest in this, some of these um, recovered uh, sites of detention, I had some chance in February to visit a couple of them. I would highly recommend and we can talk about that. And then, you know, of course, continue my research with um, Alberti. So, tennis players, my game is becoming very, very rusty. If anyone plays tennis, please let me know. If you have any context to the actual Chilean courts, that would be especially helpful. <laughs> because if you're like me and you just play, you can't find courts, it won't be helpful. And those are just some hobbies. But. All right, thank you so much. Yeah. You said that the 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 number of percentage of immigrants here is at what percentage? Six point six. Yeah, and that is like just you know grown from the three percent over the four. Yes. What do you um what do you think the impacts are of having starting from such a low number? Right? I mean like so in the US we're much higher, so right. you know, if we saw that kind of growth, would there be a lot of impact? But immigration is like something that's like common, right? Right. We're all more exposed to about three percent is really low. Yes. So what do you see as a, a, a Yeah, well I think right off the bat, education and health, right, really important because of course the kids are in the schools and a lot of these articles in the paper have been about education. I would say those are the two areas because they affect people on an everyday level. So because this is, a, I never thought about Chile as an island, I always thought of it as insular, but I never used the word island in my mind. Um, but I really get the feeling that, and you all know this already because you've had much more content with Chile and some of you are scientists that so you're thinking more in those kind of maybe ge geographical or terms, but it, that is very, very important for a country receiving immigrants because they're not immigrants coming over the border because as everyone notes all the time, you can't really cross these borders. So they're coming by these airplanes are, you know, a big deal. They're, I won't even get into this, but the Chilean government is sending these airplanes to Venezuela to bring back Chilean. I mean, everything's happening by air, which is something that doesn't happen in the United States as much. Um, so the impact right away, I would say, education and health. And you know, health is a big deal for a country that sees itself as an island and sees itself as largely exempt from a lot of the terrible things that happen in the rest of, of Latin America. You know, we we're more used to the idea that we're penetrate. We we can be penetrated and like. There's, there are a lot of things that are just going to come into the United States. But it doesn't seem like Chileans are, are used to this idea and very scared, a lot more scared of it than we would be. Um, also, you know, U.S., we were at 4% foreign foreign born population in 1973 because of the draconian laws that we had from 1921 to 1965. So we had that, but it was a gradual, gradual increase, mostly from, from Mexico over the course of the 70s and 80s. So that helped. It, it still was hard, I think, for a lot of the communities in the border areas, but it was gradual. This is so fast. This is so fast. And so, so far, because the economy has been strong, and that's why people are coming. I mean, Venezuelans are trying to come wherever, but they wouldn't be coming to Chile if the economy weren't so strong. Things are all right, but if there's a downturn in the economy or you, know, you start to see some problems um, with unemployment, then it's going to be tough. And you already see politicians beginning to take advantage of the, the, the different, different political views on immigration. You know, so far it's nothing like what we've seen in populist countries, but you do see 
people, you know, and it's natural in a democracy, you try to get votes, and if there are people out there who gravitate toward a more restrictive policy, people, politicians will use that. So that would be something that I would look out for politically, but certainly on a daily level. Education, health, and it's something we don't see as much, but at least Catalina Toho told, told me it was a very big deal when she was mayor and continues to be housing. Because the housing stocks for, you know, for low income migrants, um, or low income people in general, seem to be really precarious, and the migrants, of course, are really vulnerable because they're often living, just, we hear these, of course, this case in the U.S., you know, a lot of people in one place, and there are rapacious land, um, um, uh, landowners, not landowners, what am I talking about? Uh, landlords. Landlords, right. Yes, and um, so, uh, th this happens everywhere, but this is, this is happening so quickly and it's, people aren't used to it, you know, so, so many really interesting things are coming up, you know, as you think about the idea of migration because it's so transversal, right? It's affecting so many different areas. So, yeah, really interesting. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.